Hello there. Today on the final bar, we'll talk market rally. Yesterday was a nice sort of recovery move for uh, the S&P. Today, more follow through really leading into the close of the S&P up one and a half percent. What's interesting is it's the quarter end today. This is June 30th. So now funds have sort of locked in any sort of window dressing for the uh, for the quarter. It's now done. Tomorrow, potentially back down to earth. So the question is this rally that we've seen so far this week, is this sort of a bullish holiday week coming out of support, things are rosy and back to normal sort of move, or is it the artificial demand that comes from a quarter end window dressing before we go back to earth? We'll see what the charts can tell us about what might be coming next. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to uh, look at the markets together through the technical, behavioral, sentiment-oriented, statistical lens, try to make sense of things, but most importantly, see how today's price action relates to the longer-term trends. And, you know, as longer-term investors, it often can be very difficult to get uh, to stay away, get out of the weeds of the day-to-day uh, -day fluctuations of the market. There's actually a behavioral term for it uh, called, uh, wow, well, I'm totally blanking on the term, uh, short-termism myopia, lo uh, myopic loss aversion is what they call it. Basically, you get, uh, when you're worried about uh, you know, losing, you actually become more short-term oriented. That's what myopic uh, refers to. And so the problem is when the movements like we've seen in the last week are fluctuating very quickly, it's very easy to get sucked in the short term. But with how volatile the markets are, I would argue that the short term charts can will, will always give you signal before the longer term charts. And that's why I think regardless of where you're trying to win the game, you pay attention to the appropriate uh, short and long term trends. Now, coming up on the show, we have some great guests to help us. Uh, make sense of this, uh, these markets. Tomorrow, we have Scott Smith joining us from uh, briefing.com. We're going to take a holiday off uh, this Friday. Markets closed uh, for the 4th of July holiday here in the U.S. So uh, on Thursday of this week, we'll do our normal wrap the week segment that we usually do Friday after the close, sort of make sense of the week, get us ready for, uh, for the next week. Then coming up on next Tuesday, we have Clive Lambert joining us from Tr uh, Futures Techs. He's based in the London area. And on Wednesday, Landon Whaley, uh, from the Whaley Capital Group uh, is joining us on the 8th. The week of July 13th, which is the week after next, we're doing a special week of programming uh, called Charting the Second Half. It's going to be a fantastic uh, group of, uh, of events, special presenters, and we're going to finish with a market outlook panel. It's actually going to be an interactive discussion, so you have a chance to li uh, ask questions live of the uh, commentators, uh, the moderator, and everything that's coming up uh, that week of July 13th. So we'll be, we'll be promoting more and more of all the great events we have coming up uh, that week. Now, let's attempt to do a market recap here. So it's interesting, the S&P, you know, just chipping away further and further to the upside today, it really accelerated in the last hour. And, you know, for me, that feels a lot like sort of the quarter end uh, window dressing. If you're not familiar, right, at the end of every quarter, that's when you have a chance to, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, adjust, make adjustments to the portfolio, uh, you know, recalibrate to where you want to be. Uh, and a lot of times you in general want to buy into, you want to make your portfolio look as attractive as possible, which a lot of times means uh, I would, I would argue things like uh, big cap tech, for example, that's done very well and has outperformed. If you're not there yet, you probably want to rotate there for quarter end that when you have to timestamp your end of the quarter positioning, it shows you have really big, safe, outperforming names like Microsoft and Apple. So this tends to be a pretty good um, time for moving back to sort of the blue chip winners. And at a time when they've been so effective recently, I, I would, I would, I'm not surprised to see a nice little move today. I think the real question is going to be Wednesday and Thursday of this week and see if we sort of come back to, uh, you know, right size a little bit. If we uh, revert back to the downside, this is sort of the quarter end adjustment. Then we can put the crazy bets back on and uh, and maybe uh, and maybe move a little lower. However, it's a holiday week, and in general, a shortened holiday week tends to be sort of flat to up, lighter volume, not a, a very exciting time. But 
now is a time when just crazy things are happening all the time. So I wouldn't be surprised if some sort of catalyst comes out in the next uh, in the next day or two. But having said that, last two days, certainly going into quarter end, uh, pretty resilient, uh, S&P pushing higher. Today, the NASDAQ was leading even further up. So the S&P closed just above 3,100. Um, the, uh, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100 actually finished up almost 2%. Uh, mid caps up 1.3, small caps up 1.4. So actually uh, large caps led the way higher, which kind of makes sense, sort of a rotation into uh, energy, tech, and healthcare today, it looks like uh, overall. The VIX back lower, almost down to uh, the, uh, the 30 level again. Looking at some uh, other markets, bonds actually finished lower. They opened uh, early, uh, higher at the beginning of the day, but really traded down through the balance of the day to finish down about half a percent on the TLT. Ten-year yields back up to 65 basis points. On the commodity side, oil was actually flat to down a little bit. Gold uh, higher. Gold really accelerated out of the open and then uh, gave back a little bit of the gains, but overall finished up 0.4% with the GLD up to 167. We're going to focus a little bit on commodities today and uh, and pay attention to some of the movements that we've seen uh, and how they've related it. But as a, as a preview, silver has certainly accelerated to the upside and gold overall has held up really, really well uh, with, uh, with testing new highs. The XAU, if you look at uh, gold stocks, uh, has actually done very well testing, uh, testing new all-time highs as well. Let's look at a chart of the S&P and we'll sort of uh, fill in some of the details with the summary that I just gave you. So the chart of the S&P, uh, to, be, to be honest, by any definition, I'd have to declare it neutral. Um, you know, we were uh, certainly on the bullish side as we continued a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. The swing though, low that we saw second week in June, still sort of higher than the previous low. So overall the trend in place, when we hit a resistance around 3150, I think that's where the characteristics of the market changes a little bit. Um, this is uh, the RSI, I'm sorry, excuse me, the price hitting resistance at that same level, um, three out of uh, six sessions. So, you know, certainly uh, identifying a shorter term swing high, uh, which means we're at the very least in a, in a neutral phase. If we break below the swing low, which would be that low from uh, the second week in June, it's around 29.60, 29.70. That would confirm a downtrend of lower highs and lower lows. So at this point, we're sort of in the mid range. And what's happening now is it's evolved into what I would call a pennant pattern of lower highs, higher lows. And generally speaking, what you would look for is you break above the upper trend line taking the highs, you break below the lower trend line using the lows. One of those two things has to happen at some point, usually about um, two thirds, three quarters of the way through that pattern is when it tends to happen according to John Murphy and, uh, and we see which way the momentum, momentum goes. For me though, just based on the volatility, based on the movement I'm seeing, I think we're in this range between 3150 as the first line of the sand and really 3230 as, as, the, uh, as the extreme high there from early June. On the low side, you have 3000, which was the low from this week and you also have 2960. So those are the two support and resistance levels on both sides. I think we will, I would assume we find resistance in the upper part of that. We find support in the lower part of that. And once that stops happening, once one of those uh, levels breaks, I, I would think it would be as sort of the dam breaking and uh, we're probably going to accelerate in whatever direction that uh, breakout would tend to occur. Let's look at some of the other asset classes, uh, other, other charts, other themes. Uh, in terms of sectors, uh, as I mentioned, energy up the most today up over 2%. Technology and healthcare sort of tied for second place today. On the downside, you had utilities uh, weakest than industrials, consumer staples. So, you know, actually interesting with industrials, the airlines that all uh, ripped higher and uh, Boeing was up, you know, 10% yesterday. Um, if you like volatility, you're going to love this chart. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of movement because the price looks kind of normalized, but this was a 6% loss today after 10 after plus percent gain. So, I mean, these, these are huge swings, even though they look like smaller bars on the chart, these are really exaggerated because the volatility has been, has been pretty juiced up. So in that space in industrials, also the airlines in that same group uh, having a, have a similar experience, you get a lot of fluctuations right now as things are sort of uh, um, uh, jumping around a bit. Um, so, so interesting to see that uh, Southwest Airlines is actually one of the, the worst 10 stocks in our scooter rankings uh, today, along with Dollar Tree. Some of the dollar stores uh, sort of uh, stalling out a little bit going, uh, going on the upside. Plenty of stocks uh, working pretty well, though. And again, this is why it feels like sort of a stabilizing market with, you know, really decent uh, opportunity for stock picking only because there are stocks, even within certain sectors, that are breaking to new highs, that are stocks that are breaking to new lows, and then the sort of the average stock kind of in the middle. Uh, Xilinx comes to mind. This is in the semiconductor group. The semiconductor relative performance has continued to be impressive, 
Xilinx is a chart that looks actually very different than the average chart in the S&P because it had been in an established downtrend for quite a while. Look at the underperformance for the second half of 2019 going into the March lows and pretty much just before that, it turned up and even though it's not been a dramatic outperformer, look at this pattern of higher highs as it continues to break out. It just broke above the, the high from the first week in June, uh, just today on a gap higher with the stock up uh, 7%. So in general, semiconductors tend to be a good leading indicator for the market as a whole. Uh, when that group is doing well, the, uh, the market tends to be in a pretty decent place. You'll see AMD as, a, as another one that gapped up today in the, in the same uh, group. Uh, so worth noting some of those uh, some of those names that appear on the big uh, the gainers list. In terms of any other uh, themes to pick out today before we go on to our to our next segment, is uh, just noting some of the industries that did well today. You notice three of them are within materials. This is gold mining, mining, and non ferrous metals. This is like Newmont Mining and others. These are groups that had been uh, relatively beaten down on a relative basis, had struggled a little bit. You can see that the uh, chart of uh, of these guys starting to improve a little bit. These are the three different groups within. Uh, within materials at all uh, uh, were at the top of the return list today. Also things like pipelines and EMP stocks within energy, uh, also at the top. Semiconductors I mentioned before, kind of an interesting one, asset managers, even though financials as a whole have been, you know, relatively uh, anemic, especially on a relative basis, you can see that uh, it's one of the top 10 groups. I noticed uh, State Street there is one of the top 10 as well. I still I'm not a huge fan of the chart because you can see it's sort of a sideways pattern. So I don't think there's a lot to get super excited about, uh, but it's not horribly negative. It's interesting if you look within the financial sector, you see this, you see regional banks all sort of doing a similar sort of thing, potentially sort of a bottom fishing idea, uh, sort of a weaker couple of weeks and potentially starting to rally, uh, to rally up there. The relative strength on financials has just been so uh, negative for so while. It's hard for me to get super excited about the prospects there. Also worth noting on the downside, as I mentioned, airlines, defense, aerospace, three of the industrials groups uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the uh, list. That's our market recap for today. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll see you back here in a minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. We're gonna do a mailbag segment a little later in the show. As a reminder, the way to get questions to us, just shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Shoot us any questions you have about charts, about the markets, about whatever you're seeing, or on Twitter at finalbarsctv. Just tag us in a comment. We'll capture all of those and I would love to answer one of your questions on the air in a later show. I wanna welcome on uh, my friend, Jim Smith. Uh, from GAN Analysis. I followed Jim's work for years. We had him on the show uh, a little while ago, and I'd love to update uh, his thinking on uh, the commodity complex. Jim, welcome back to the show. Thanks a lot, Dave. Happy to be so, on your show. Yeah, so silver is certainly uh, one of the stories today, up pretty significantly, and, and uh, precious metals as a whole up, uh, up, up overall. But, you know, silver really moved. What is your toolkit? And I know you're, you're focusing on GAN Analysis. What can you tell us about, uh, about the, the picture for silver here? Well, I'm doing GAN, but um, what I would advise your, uh, your viewers that even if you're doing GAN, and if you see that a Fibonacci number is working, well, by all means, use it. And I certainly do. And you can see from this chart, um, I'm measuring down from high, uh, the April 2011 high at 48.61. This is just a very simple retracement of the high 
you got a 38.2% retracement at $30.04, and you got a 50% retracement at $24.30, 61.8% retracement at 1857. And the reason that level is so particularly important right now is because we're testing it. I didn't see the exact close, but I was following it through the day. It seemed like it went right to that level and it got slightly above it intraday, but we may have closed right on it or very close. So that always leaves you kind of frustrated because you'd ideally like to see it blow through it by 50 cents. But, you know, the idea is if you close above that level, the theory is that you go to the next level, which would be the 50% mark at 2430. And that would be very, you know, that's a pretty big move. Um, the reason I'm so excited about silver is that we've been knocking at the door for uh, how many months there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, quite a few months, you know? Um, and the theory is that the more times you knock at the door, the more likely you're gonna go through the door. And so if it's this time, we don't know for sure, but you know, if you want to feel safe, maybe you wait for a close above, I don't know, 1875. And if you do that, you know, then you will go, um, you will go to new highs. So, uh, well, by new highs, I mean new above the, uh, the uh, 1939 was the uh, high from last September on the September contract. Right. Um, so if you if you get above 1857, let's say you give yourself a little slack, you call it 1875, you close above that, you should be looking for a move to 1939 and then after, thereafter 2430. So yeah. I think I think you're going to get a big move up and you know, that's that's what uh, we've been waiting for for how many months? Almost a practically a year actually. You know, it's one of those classic uh, trading uh, comments that, the, you know, the, the broader the base, the higher in space or some form of that, which is, you know, however long it takes uh, a, a price to, to build up momentum before breaking out, usually the, you know, the, the, the higher it's going to tend to go. So it certainly seems to be setting up pretty well. What I love, the thing I love the most about your chart is the comment here in the upper right, the stock market's not the only game in town. It's a great reminder to focus on where the price action is and not necessarily on a particular asset, right? Exactly. Because um, I think there is a temptation for people to stay in the stock market, especially tech stocks, which have been where all the fun is. Yeah. And um, they, they forget about other markets. And I think silver has been beaten down for so long, people just forgot about it. No, I do want to make make time because last time you were here, Jim, we talked about the gold market in in detail, and and we talked about you know potential acceleration to the to the upside, which certainly has seemed to be to be playing through. What what can you tell us about the picture for gold here now? Well, um, I believe you're on your way to new highs. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 if you want to be safe, wait for a close. I didn't see the exact close, but if it closes above eighteen hundred, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you, you're going to get a move above 19. Uh, on this chart, it shows, you know, the, uh, the high at 1924. It's actually 1923.7. But, you know, depending on which contract you were looking at. But uh, I believe if you close above 1800, you're going above 1924. You're probably going to 21. I have a GAN target at 2149. Wow. And I, I believe that you could easily do that in a matter of months. Hmm. Now, when you say so you mentioned 2149 in a matter of months, I mean, how, how would you relate the price versus the time going forward? Is there a, is there a, a, a time range in that, that the toolkit would aim for that? Or is it more just a, a, a fact, more like Fibonacci retracements where it's about the relationships of the, of the price levels? Well, there is a chart that I am, I'm not showing here now, but if, you know, if somebody subscribed, I'll show it to them. There's a, uh, a very special chart that shows a projection at 2149. And uh, I really like it, but um, I want to leave your listeners sort of hanging there a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, the picture for silver setting up very well and gold, it looks like 1800 is the level. If we break above that, it certainly seems to be 
a higher highs in store. So that was Jim Smith from Gann Analysis. And I followed Jim's work for a number of years. I, what, what is interesting to me, I'm not a big cycle guy, but I think they, they're valuable. I think they're interesting and I think they work. It's just not a part of my normal toolkit. So I found surrounding myself with people like Jim that can talk about cycles, talk about levels, uh, can, be, can be very, very helpful. So interesting how that's setting up on the uh, bullish side uh, within commodities, particularly uh, precious metals, gold and silver. We need to move on to our mailbag segment, the final bar mailbag. I love making the show interactive, answering your questions, hearing from you. I want to start out with the polls. We actually asked a lot of you recently a particular question. I went with more of the quiz approach. So we said, what constitutes a bearish divergence with price and RSI? So as opposed to our normal uh, surveys, there actually is a right answer to this. So we'll talk about it. It was you know, basically, is the price going higher and lo or lower? And is the RSI going higher and lower? 88% of you uh, absolutely right. So team final bar, well done. Uh, but higher price and lower RSI is what constitutes a bearish divergence. This, the reason why this is important um, is because with things like the NASDAQ 100, um, the Qs, uh, for example, you'll see that sort of uh, uh, pattern right now. Here we go with the Qs. Uh, you know, so a, a classic bearish divergence, sort of what we're seeing here with this chart, also with Microsoft, with Apple, with Amazon, with a lot of these names, higher highs in price, so price going higher, lower peaks in RSI, so the, the RSI going lower, and that higher price, lower RSI is what constitutes a bearish divergence. In general, that tends to resolve to the downside. The, the kicker is it doesn't always happen, right? So the way I tend to think of it, bearish divergences or a bullish divergence and it tends to be more effective at tops to be honest with you i, I have found this uh is sort of a leading indicator and it's something that puts it on the radar actually breaking down the price breaking down through trend lines the price making a lower high and a lower low the rsi breaking down through its swing low all of those things would validate would be more of a lagging indicator confirming that uh that the bearish divergence has taken place and uh and that the price is going lower so great great answer on there we have a new poll running uh, right now in, uh, in our various outlets. So please make sure you answer where you can. Our next mailbag question, da, 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 my thought with the XLU is, uh, is it looks like a double top. I could see downside to 47. Uh, the weekly charts have support levels at that level as well. Uh, how does that sound? Let me look at the XLU here. You actually sent a chart, which I'm bringing up. This is not my chart, this was yours. So my first ob ob observation, and again, I say everything in the spirit of constructive criticism and uh, take it with what you can. This chart looks really busy to me. You'll notice my charts tend to be super simple. And that probably comes from the fact that much of my career has been, has been spent uh, trying to explain charts to other people and educate them using charts. So I found the simpler, the better. And I've also found if you have too many inputs, then you, you, are, you are opening yourself up to uh, things like confirmation bias and other things that, that are basically looking for signals to validate your point of view as opposed to drawing the information. But if you can use this and you can use it in a disciplined way, do it. And, and I think that's totally fine. When you're talking about a double top, I don't think I actually see that anywhere here. I'm guessing you're talking about this, which is top number one, top number two. But here's the problem. A double top, like a true double top, is really meant to be more um, consistent, right? So something that's more um, even keeled. Uh, and, I'm, you know, what's a good example of a double? You know, maybe, maybe this would be, although, of course, it's a little bit of a higher high, so that's probably not a great... Uh, great idea either. Um, but but in general, right? So I, I think something like a double top, you want it to be a horizontal resistance level. So like with the XLY, the consumer discretionary sector, I think that 132 level, because we broke above it, but didn't really stay above it. I think you could consider that more of a classic sort of double top. Whereas the chart that you sent, the XLY is actually sloping upwards over that period. I don't know if I would call it as much of a, of a pure double top. And also the fact that the lows are getting higher. So it's more of a a parallel uh, a channel sort of going uh, back to the upside. So I don't know if that alone would be enough to tell me um, to get to get nervous. What would be interesting to me is if we break below trend line uh, support, right? So what you're doing when you're measuring the height of this pattern and then projecting it down from that breakdown, you're assuming that we're breaking down through that support level. So if and when that happens, I would agree with you that it's more distributive. The pattern's breaking down, we're breaking to new swing lows, and I could see opening the door to the low that you suggest. And, and I think what you've hit on here is the measurement on a lot of these consolidation moves that we've seen is if you break down through support, it measures pretty low and it's not going back down to the March low, but it's down in that general vicinity, which would be a huge uh, down move from where we're at. And that's why I think things like the S&P 3000 level and 
all the support levels with the mindful six, those six stocks we talked about uh, end of last week. That's why I think those levels are so important because if we start breaking down through those support levels, you make the measurements based on the height of the recent patterns and you have a pretty deep uh, downtrend to look at. Question number two, there are some analysts who advocate a sell-off when a parabola is broken. We're seeing WKHS go parabolic, uh, and I, I brought this chart up. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Anytime a chart looks like it's not on log scale and then you realize it actually is, it reminds me of like Tesla when it's going vertical or some other names. Um, it tells you things are really accelerating, and, and you're right. This has been an extreme move uh, going up. This is a small cap stock that's rallied. It's over a billion market cap now, but you know it's just really accelerated to the upside. I, I find these charts to be incredibly challenging and not ideal. If you've missed it, I think it's hard to justify getting in right now, um, only because you're in really, uh, pun intended, uncharted territory. Say so nothing of the fact that the RSI is at 95, which is incredibly, incredibly unusual. But here's the thing, in general, when an RSI is above 80, when it's extremely overbought, it usually means at least a bit of a pullback before one more uh, move higher. So, you know, all else being equal, something goes parabolic when it breaks it. What that tells you is that the characteristics have changed. And so if you do own a name like this, that's the time to think about okay, do I take some of it off the table? Do I, do I reduce my position 50% or something like that as a way to acknowledge the fact that it's gone vertical and it's no longer going vertical. But a breakdown, a breakdown of support, a breakdown through uh, the swing low. Uh, but again, because it's happened so quickly, it can be very, very challenging because uh, it, can, it can turn very quickly on you. So, so for me, I, again, I think a, a change out of the parabolic pattern absolutely makes sense. And I think that's a, that's a way to, uh, to look for it here. The last question that we have to wrap the show, um, can you elaborate on how tra traders plan exits for trends with unknown profit tar targets? I can't seem to wrap my head around why some people scale out on the way up or close a position before being stopped, uh, stopped out. You know, let's assume like this is, a, this is one of your, your stocks you're holding. So there are different ways to think about it, right? So some, some would say, um, you know, when, when a position gains X percent, when I gain 25% on my position, I'm going to take some off the table no matter what. And that's one way of locking in profits, right? When you've gained a lot, let's say you bought the Qs, perfect foresight, you bought them on March 23rd. And since then, it's just been this fantastic position. And, and now it's gone up a ton from 170 to 250. And so, you know, somewhere along the way, you could lock in a percent gain target and 25% often comes to mind as a, as a time to take some off the table and leave the rest to run. In general, right, you're better served by letting your profits run. I think we've seen that, especially with the technology stocks that have performed so well consistently. It's not just a quick gain and then that's it. You're better off just sitting in a position like this and just letting it run. So having part of your position just sort of run until you get some lagging indicator telling you that the trend is no longer in play can be an ideal situation because you lock in some of the gains, but you'll, and then you let the rest, if this goes up another hundred points, you continue to go up uh, on that there as well. So I think there, there's much more I could, I could say on this topic. We have to wrap for time, but that's what I would say is, is ideally hitting a percent target can be good to lock in some of the gains, but make sure, uh, you know, letting, letting profits run can be, uh, can be more ideal as well. We need to wrap the show. Three charts, three minutes. Folks, here we go. Chart number one is the dollar index. We didn't talk a lot about this. But we did talk about gold and silver being in, uh, in rally mode. The dollar's actually stabilized a little bit. Hit resistance on the UUP around 2640. That's coming off of uh, a previous support level that we identified from, uh, from back here, just up around 26. So what's interesting is the sell-off has sort of stabilized. And the question is, do we get a new down leg? If and when we do, and it's interesting, the RSI remains below 50, which tells you we're overall in a negative mode here. If it does, if it remains below the 200-day, if it breaks new swing lows, again, that would uh, indicate that non-U.S. markets will continue to outperform, which would be a theme I think a lot of people are unprepared for. Chart number two is the relative strength in semiconductors, which has broken to new highs. We talked about some semi-stocks that were in the top 10 list today, things like uh, AMD and, and others. The relative strength continues to go up, which means, again, as one data point Strength in summies makes me feel pretty, uh, you know, at least okay about the overall market environment. Chart number three, we talked about the resilience in gold. We talked about Jim Smith's uh, upside targets for gold, which are pretty aggressive to the upside. Interesting to see the gold and silver index dollar side, XAU, testing new highs. So it hit a high in mid-May, pulled back to the 50-day, now going back to the upside. Relative strength improving. It's not yet overbought. And overall, I think it's setting up pretty well for further upside as well. So I agree with Jim in that. Commodities, especially the gold uh, complex, looks pretty uh, attractive here. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday for the final bar. Special thanks to my guest, Jim Smith from GAN Analysis, for joining us from, uh, from Texas today. 
For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.